Excellent. Thank you so much. And and uh, thank you all who are tuning in from London, all over the world, wherever you are. It's great to be here with you today virtually to talk about how to teach the OWASP top 10 to beginning developers. Uh, as Sam mentioned, I'm Olivia Liddell, a technical curriculum developer at AWS. And what I'm presenting here is actually a personal side project that I started thinking about and developing last summer as sort of a, a quarantine project. Project. So in between doing a lot of knitting and cross stitching and baking bread, I also thought, well, what if there's a way that I can try to help out some of the developers in our community who want to learn about security, but aren't quite sure where to get started. And so I'm going to start here because first I always love uh, security stock photos and how ridiculous they can be. And I came across this one and thought I absolutely need to put this in my presentation because I know for many beginning developers, the idea of learning about security or specifically application security can look like this. To give you some context, uh, as Sam mentioned, I, I speak frequently at tech conferences and usually what I, I've seen in, uh, throughout these events is that people will come up to me afterwards and say, Olivia, thanks so much for your talk. And it, that's so cool that you're into security. I wish that I could be into security too. And I, I usually will say to them, well, why not? And just in a very honest, candid way. And what, what comes out of that in these discussions I've had with beginning developers is that many of them will express to me the idea that they don't believe that they are a security person. That sure, they, they love learning about how to write code, but the idea of security feels like something that is very walled off, something that's very difficult for them to begin to grasp. And so as I started to think about this some more myself, I had this idea of what if we could intervene even earlier in the process of someone's learning journey as they're learning about writing code. Now, when I say beginning developers, to give you an idea of exactly what I'm focusing in on here, I was thinking even for developers who are just a few weeks or few months into learning code, so perhaps you have someone who knows how to write HTML, then they got fancy with some CSS and their web pages can look very fancy, but then they learn a little bit of JavaScript too. But, you know, so they're in the very early stages. What often happens is that this idea of security is not introduced until much later in the process for them. So with this, I'd like to think of it as a way of introducing secure coding as a, a fundamental best practice early on, even if someone does not yet know what, for example, a SQL injection is. And what I'll be presenting today is a companion workbook for beginning developers. The, the idea is not that this workbook that I'll show you can be a, a totally exhaustive resource, a single place to go for learning about the OWASP top 10, but rather I think of it as being specifically a companion workbook as someone is using whichever other videos, work, uh, videos, tutorials, written documentation to learn about the OWASP top 10. This workbook can be like their buddy on the side who's giving them questions and giving them an opportunity to pause and reflect and think before they move forward. And so I also wanted to show you this graphic here to give you a sense of where this project fits in into the much larger picture of learning about the OWASP top 10. Uh, I'm sure for, for many of you who are watching, you've come to learn about the top 10 through any number of different methods. Perhaps you went to a meetup that was about teaching the top 10 in an hour. Perhaps you decided to go to the top 10 documentation on your own and read over the course of a few days and, and so forth. If you look in this gray box on the left that encompasses all the possible teaching approaches, learning tools, target audiences, and so forth, that little purple bubble that's in there is where this workbook fits in. So it's not to say that it's going to be for every single learning need that's out there, but specifically what I'm hoping to do is have this available as a tool for people who do who could benefit from a learning approach that takes things a little bit more slowly and makes the top 10 a lot more accessible for them. So here's where I started. 
And this is where I'm getting into some teaching methodology. As Sam mentioned in my introduction, I'm a former teacher. I, I taught, um, so I'll say this in the American uh, levels first and then try to convert it over to the English uh, equivalent. I, I taught students who were in the third grade and also the fifth through eighth grade, which I think the, the latter ones are like year seven, eight, and nine in the UK possibly. Uh, students who are uh, adolescents, like 11 to 14 years old. And that was before I transitioned into a career of uh, doing adult education. A lot of the, the parallels are similar though. And regardless of the age of the students that I've been teaching or training, it all starts with working backwards. Because I, I will admit, whenever I get really excited about starting a new project, I get so focused on the idea of how it's going to look in the end. And I think of all the flashy things I'm going to put in there and how it's just going to be this most amazing thing ever. But then I have to tell myself, okay, Olivia, slow down and actually work backwards. Because before I start building something, I need to think about these two questions first. First, who exactly do I want to help? And the reason I ask this question first is that when you think about the community of developers who are learning about security, that can include anyone from complete beginners to those who've been working with security for 10, 15, 20 years. So in order to create the training uh, materials that are gonna be the most effective and most targeted, I, as a content creator, needed to ensure that I knew exactly who I wanted to help with this. And for any of you who are watching this and your, your purpose for being here today is that you are curious about creating materials of your own to help others, I would encourage you to do the exact same thing. And no, it is absolutely okay, preferable even, to figure out a very small subset of your audience that you want to help so that you can target to that specific group's needs instead of trying to create one single product that is gonna address everybody's needs because that can get a little, um, a little difficult to handle. And next, I asked myself, what should learners be able to do as a result of completing this workbook? And I say, what should they be able to do? Because that is where in, in the course of teaching and training, it's very easy to have this slippery slope of becoming vague and thinking, well, I, I want people to learn about the top 10. Okay, that's a good starting point, but I, I knew I needed to take it further. And in order to do this, I, I decided to use this framework that's called Bloom's Taxonomy. And when I first started learning uh, through my teacher training program many years ago, I, I didn't like this. I, I wanted to go straight in and just start teaching people and, and give them knowledge. But I soon realized that in order to, to be the most effective at this, I needed to first think about what am I expecting my learners to be able to do? And at the very bottom of this, uh, this pyramid that you have here, that's the most basic level of remembering. So for example, you might design a, a training course or lesson so that the learners can simply remember something, recall it. You tell them some information, they tell it back to you, and you move on. But then as you get into what we would call higher levels of thinking, that goes into not just remembering a concept, but being able to uh, explain what that is, being able to describe it, or even go higher to do things such as comparing and contrasting, all the way up to creating, so developing, investigating. As you look at this it, and break it down, it becomes very clear over time that there's a distinction between the upper and lower levels of that. And in the case of the top 10, it's the difference between saying that you want a learner to be able to uh, know what a, a SQL injection is versus being able to write secure code that's relevant to that uh, particular uh, risk and so forth. So knowing that I needed to figure out what I wanted my outcomes to be, that's when I, I got here. I, I decided I wanna help beginning developers. And this is uh, truly something I, I'm just passionate about. I mean, I think about the work that I do every day at AWS, the courses that I specifically develop are targeted to our beginning customers and partners. 
people who have no idea what the AWS cloud is, and they're coming to this from, from uh, having a complete blank slate and wanting to learn. For me, that is my happy place because uh, I think there's a certain amount of empathy that goes into helping beginning learners that uh, you want to make sure that beginners feel comfortable confident and also competent. So that's, I knew that, that whatever I created was gonna target that audience. Next, I pulled out very specific objectives to, to help guide me here. So I wanted learners to be able to identify the rest that are included in the OWASP top 10. So thinking about developers who don't know what the top 10 list includes, it's a, a simple objective, identify what they are. Next, go into describing what they are. So you see there's a difference between identifying what the risks are and then actually describing them in your own words. The next level up is being able to compare and contrast them. And I'll explain a little bit more about why that matters later on. And then the last part is to relate the top 10 risks and prevention strategies to real life scenarios. That last bullet point was really important for me because uh, one of the key factors that tends to distinguish adult learning theory from uh, learn from teaching and training younger students is that typically adults need to be able to understand exactly how what they are learning can be applied to the work that they need to do. So it, it's usually not just enough to be able to say, here's some information about this, here's some information about that. Rather, it, it, it actually ties back into comparing and contrasting because first, you need to help them be able to draw connections between the different parts of what they're learning, and then also connect that to how they will need to use it to do some hands-on work. Notice that with this, I'm not going to the level of teaching developers how to write secure code because that, for me, fell outside the scope of what I wanted to accomplish. But all of this is to say, I want to be able to help beginning developers get a solid foundation with the OWASP top 10 and feel that this is something that they can even just talk about. And they might not know yet how to write the secure code, but they're aware of what's in the top 10 list and they're able to talk about it in their own words. Now, here is where I, 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 uh, I moved on once I had my objective set. I sat down with the top 10, looked at the list and at first, I thought, okay, I'm making this workbook about the top 10. Number one, injection, fun. <laughs> now, that for me, I, I could look at injection and, and talk about that and describe it in a number of different ways. But something that occurred to me was that if I were to sit down with a beginning developer, remember someone who's just coming into HTML, CSS, maybe a little bit of another language beyond that, how likely is it that they can understand injection is the first uh, is the first item on this list? Because if you say to someone, oh yeah, there's this thing called a SQL injection, then you have to explain what SQL is. So in, in my experience as a trainer and teacher, what I try not to do is, is avoid situations where I'm explaining a concept to someone and then right away I say to them, oh, by the way, before you can understand this first thing, you also have to understand this other thing that's part of that too. I know for myself, when I'm in learning, learning context like that, it, it becomes very easy for me to shut down and feel that, oh goodness, there's, I don't understand SQL, so what chance do I have of understanding what you're saying is a SQL injection? So for, for this workbook, I decided to take the approach of reordering the, the top 10. Now I include a note in detail about why this, this list is in this order, but I felt that it was important to put it in a way that beginners could more easily grasp. Now what you see on the right here is the order that I settled on for the companion workbook and the green and red numbers in parentheses are just there to show you where uh, an item shifted from its position on the left. So for example, in the official OWASP order, using components with known vulnerabilities is an item number nine. In the companion workbook, it moved up eight spots and it's, it's number one. Again, I'm not trying to change uh, the, the order officially, but think about it like this. If you were to try to explain to someone uh, these, these different risks, 
which ones are going to be more easy for them to understand. And in the workbook, I took the approach of explaining these, not just in the sense of secure coding practices, but even encouraging learners to think about it in just more general terms. So things like saying, hey, you're, uh, you're using a, a program that's known to have some issues with it, don't do that. Why would you do that? And, and so forth. And, and I think as a best practice, the more that you can try to connect concepts to other experiences that learners might have had outside of security, that helps to get more buy-in. I mean, I can tell you so many times in my experience, the training customers in, in my previous jobs on security, as soon as you say security, it's like you can see the fear in people's eyes. They'll say, oh no, I, I, I can't do security. But yet, if I explain it in the sense of, you know, suppose you're sharing some photos with somebody and you put in a photo album, don't you want to put permissions on that album and make sure that only your best friends see them and not some random people on the internet? And they'll say, yeah, of course. And I'll say, guess what? That's security. You're doing these things all along. And uh, in other words, making sure that people feel comfortable with this. And looking at the list, you'll, you'll see that it starts to build into the more um, more difficult concepts, I, I would say, as, as the list goes on. But I wanted this to be something that learners could approach and start to feel the sense of confidence building as they are going along. Okay. So let me go back one slide here. So one thing that I wanted to focus on is what I consider to be the language of security. And uh, to, to give you some insight into my background, when I was in college, I studied anthropology and specifically linguistic anthropology. So thinking about how different cultures and societies use language, the idea of language acquisition, the role that language can play within societies and cultures. And then when I was teaching, the, the subject that I taught was actually uh, Arabic. So. Uh, for any of you who speak Arabic, uh, assalamu alaikum. <laughs> that means hi, basically. Uh, so even though I, I'm no longer a language teacher, this idea of language and linguistics still permeates throughout everything that I do, especially in teaching. And I, I came across this quote from a German linguist named William von Humboldt, uh, who lived in the, the 17, 1800s. And he wrote, we cannot really teach language. We can only create conditions in which it will develop spontaneously in the mind in its own way. So I, I thought about this. And as, I'm, as I was creating the workbook, which I'll uh, show you momentarily coming up in a few slides, I wanted to give learners an opportunity to not just read a list of security risks, but also to take it further and be able to feel that they could truly own and use that language of security. Because let's be honest right now, and I'll be the first one to raise my hand for this. How many of you have ever gone through some kind of training course, whether on security or something else, you go through all the modules, you watch all the videos, and then you give yourself a pat on the back because you feel that you've learned something, but then how likely is it that you can turn it around and say the talk about what you've learned in your own words? Sometimes yes. But I know often it's the case where you breeze through the training, but you, you haven't yet been given the opportunity to really uh, to sit with it and learn how to talk about it in your own words. So that was one thing that was very important for me, especially because I want beginning developers to not only learn these concepts, but if they're going to be using this to get a job as a, as a developer, I want them to have that practice of being able to talk about this confidently. So you'll see that come up. And the, the second focus area that I, that I centered around was uh, the, the concepts of reflection and metacognition. Now, when you're learning a new concept, it's so important to periodically pause and ask yourself these two things. With reflection, what do I know? And when that shifts into metacognition, it becomes the question of, well, how do I know that I know this? In, in other words, what you're doing when you in, introduce ongoing reflection and metacognition is that you're slowing down uh, the, the learning process a little bit and intentionally in, injecting, so to speak, options or opportunities for you to pause and think 
and, and really look back on not just how far you've come, but how you know that you understand something or that you don't. And I'll, I'll give you an example of this for myself that's a little bit embarrassing to admit, but you know what? I'm just going to put it out there. <laughs> when I personally was first learning about AWS services and, and starting to prepare for a certification exam, one of the things that I personally like to do a lot is start with uh, just taking inventory of where I currently am. And for any particular concept, I will write down everything that I currently know about that topic, or I'll record myself talking on video. Same thing, just depends on what I want to do. And I came across uh, um, <laughs> AWS uh, Systems Manager, and I remember I, I had written a note that said, um, I guess you use that to manage systems. Same with cloud formation. I said, you use this to form some cloud resources. I mean, it, it's kind of, like I said, embarrassing to look back, but I'm so glad that I did that as my starting point because over time I was able to continue to reflect again and write a lot more details about what I had learned. And, you know, sometimes it's so easy to get into a concept and assume that because you know something now, you've always known it all along. But with this workbook, I want to give learners that opportunity to have that proof that, yes, there once was a time when you did not know anything about uh, cross-site scripting, but now you know a little bit more. So these are definitely two essential building blocks that can help to establish the solid foundation for beginners. And so I'm going to show you a sample section from the workbook and then actually switch over to the workbook itself. Actually, I'm going to switch over to that right now. So, oh, hello, people who are in the, uh, in the workbook. <laughs> that always throws me off because when I, I opened this earlier, there was no one up here. And I'm like, who's creeping in my Google Doc? <laughs> but um, let me scroll through this here. So. Yes, I shared the link uh, on YouTube, Olivia. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I appreciate it. It always just kind of takes me off guard because I'm talking about security and then I'm like, oh, yes, this is being shared. So that's OK. <laughs> so this is the, the, um, the workbook here. And something else I'll say that I, for myself as a curriculum developer, it's so easy for me to go into this rabbit hole of spending way too much time thinking about which platform I want to use to host a, a, a training resource, but not actually develop the training resource. And I decided I'm going to keep this simple. I don't want people to have to feel like they need to sign up for something extra or have yet another site to use. I just want this information in the hands of people who can use it and start benefiting from it right away. So I started with a simple Google Doc and you'll see as you go throughout, it gives you the directions for how to copy, save this, put this into your own Google Drive and so forth. And so I, I wanna start here with this pre-assessment. This is uh, the, the part I mentioned that I know it can be a little bit challenging for learners because if you don't yet know anything about these, it, it's, it can feel a little bit strange to say, I don't know anything. But for those of you who are watching this and you are my target audience for this, please, 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 I promise you, dig deep into your mind and write anything at all that you can think of about this. Because I, I guarantee if you do that, then you're able to, um, really be able to reflect back on how far you've come. I see that there is, uh, there are rather a couple of questions here. Uh, question, um, we need to teach the OWASP top 10 to experienced developers too. Absolutely agree. Uh, what advice can you give to experienced developers? You know, I, I'm so glad uh, this question came up because the, the advice I would give for more experienced developers Start here with the workbook as well. Uh, it, it may be a good opportunity to kind of gauge your knowledge and see just how much you already know and really hone in on that kind of reflection and metacognition that I mentioned to fine tune some parts that you're like, oh yeah, I thought I knew a little bit more about this, but it turns out this is more of a growth opportunity for me. Uh, another thing that I would encourage you to do with this workbook is especially if you're an experienced developer who happens to be mentoring someone who's a junior, use this as a way to, um, or as a resource in your shared mentoring sessions so that as you can teach someone else about security, 
you're not having to come up with the questions of how to guide them. You can almost like work on this workbook together. And I think that there's, it, I, I could talk about mentoring all day, but I think that for someone who's more experienced, definitely use mentoring as a way to not only help someone else, but uh, also um, reinforce what you yourself already know. And there was another question. Do you include sample code in your workbook? Yes, there's just a couple of them, uh, like further down, like the XCE contains some sample code there. But I, that was definitely something that I, I kind of struggled with a bit or wrestled with back and forth because let me actually jump to that section here. I wanted to make sure, so like this, for example, uh, that I wasn't throwing learners too far into the woods so that they're going through this workbook, everything's great, they're starting to build this positive energy and feeling confident, and then they get to this and they're like, oh goodness, no, I, I, I all, abandon all hope, this is, <laughs> I can't do this anymore. So um, I, I think in the future iterations of this, like especially as I, I get to the next stages of what I want to do to create like a hands-on uh, conference workshop that takes this to the next stage, that would definitely include some more um, uh, sample code. But one of the things that I put on here was this right here, which is, which parts of the code example were you able to understand? Which parts were unclear? And that's where I think it, it's up to the learner to be very honest with themselves and say, well, I understood like this LL one, two, three, four, up to nine, because that, that looks like it's enumerating nine different things, but I, I really didn't understand uh, this, this other part down here and so forth. So putting code in there, but in a way that gives learners a chance to pause and reflect and, and not just feel like they're being thrown in. Um question about uh yeah so there is a uh are you aware of the OWASP education and training uh committee uh and yeah so actually I presented about this in January and as a result of um on the OWASP dev slop show they've uh, I, I was invited to participate with the OWASP education uh committee and met with them um last week and yeah, it's, it's been wonderful to uh, connect with some like-minded individuals and, and see what, what other types of education initiatives are out there. Uh, just knowing that with OWASP and the community, I, I just wanna say that as I was developing this and telling friends about this, they would ask me like, oh, how much are you charging for this? Like, where are you gonna sell it? And I said, what? That's, no, <laughs> that's never my intention. I, I feel that all of us in this community have so many gifts and talents to offer. And sometimes I myself as a former teacher have felt like someone who's out of place in the room because I come from a different background. But then I realize over time that actually is, is an asset. And I'm, I'm so happy to be able to create things like this that are a little bit different that can help people who are really looking for this kind of uh, education and knowledge. Yeah. So let me just go to uh, to go up a little bit to the first section here. So if I wanted to go to something like using components with known vulnerabilities, the way that you would use this workbook is that you read through a sample, the, the simple introduction here, and then you have some reflection questions. You also have examples of a uh, ABC company. Uh, as I was creating these scenarios, I was thinking, oh goodness, I would not want to work at ABC company because they do not have, <laughs> they have a lot going on and, and not in a good way here. So uh, for, for instance, the developers are getting close to the deadline. They need to finish the application soon. Uh, they want to use a, a component, but it has known vulnerabilities. So how would you advise the developers to proceed and why? I think here it's so crucial to give learners opportunities to pause and think about what would they do in that situation? Because the, the difference here is that we're going beyond just uh, here's, uh, here's a security issue and move on to the next one, but really taking the time to extend that to some true application. And just really quickly here, each, each section includes some sample items for prevention and links to learn more. 
As I mentioned, this is not intended to be the only resource that learners will ever use to learn about the OWASP top 10, but I want them to be able to build their knowledge over time and have these opportunities to pause, reflect, and be able to compare things like uh, what's the difference between uh, security misconfiguration and broken access control. You know, they both sound like some kind of security issue for complete beginners. So how do you break down what those differences are? And I have just a couple more slides as we uh, before we get into additional Q&A. So I, I, I launched this as a small pilot test amongst a, a group of trusted friends who span the, the, the range from uh, uh, de experienced developers, some beginners, some of my friends who, uh, are, who don't really know much about uh, coding at all. And I wanted to get their take on this as well. Uh, one of my friends who's a former CTO and he, has, he had some really great insights from his perspective. What I heard uh, as feedback from this was that it was very well designed for the target audience. That's key to me because like I said, with what I do every day at work, creating courses for beginners is a lot more difficult than you would think. Because in other words, you need to have uh, the knowledge that's this big, but be able to distill it down at a level that's more for this and not overwhelm people with more than what they need. They, they also shared that the reflection exercises were really helpful for sparking insights. We also talked about how to determine the right amount of content for each risk. This, it can be a slippery slope, right? Because you don't want it to be the case that you're telling someone every single thing that's out there. You wanna keep it short, but give them enough to encourage them to learn more. Uh, we also, with the, uh, the fourth bullet point, my friend Carl, who uh, was a former CTO that I mentioned, he said a key point to include is this idea of real world trade-offs that often needs to be made to balance security with the company's other priorities. I was so glad that he mentioned it because that is something that beginning and experienced developers need to consider that it's all well and good to talk about these ideas in this idealized bubble, but sometimes you have to think about how might this play out if a company has these other priorities that they're balancing? And then some people said to consider including multiple choice review questions for each risk. And I thought about that. And it, it's difficult because I know when I'm creating a training course that's specifically for a certification exam, that's, you know, you're definitely going to have the multiple choice questions because that's what the, the students are going to have to be expected to do. In this case, I intentionally chose not to include multiple choice questions at this point because I didn't want a student to take this, go through this workbook, answer a few questions right, and have this false sense of mastery that they know how to do something with that. I, I think multiple choice questions can be helpful to supplement in, and I think in future iterations I will. But in this case, I uh, this is me being a little bit rigorous and wanting to. Uh, give students a challenge. <laughs> so in closing, I'm very excited to see how more developers will respond to the workbook. Uh, I've got to say in the, the first days and weeks after I launched this, I was crying a bit, um, good tears, because I was getting emails from people all over the world who were saying, thank you so much for, I'm about to cry now. Um, thank you so much for creating this because I've wanted to learn about security it's, it's been on my list to do, but I haven't been able to find something that actually makes me feel like I can do it. And I, I just think there's so much power in that in helping people to feel that they are able to even take some first steps. And so the next plan is to incorporate this into a conference workshop that will go further to include some hands-on coding exercises, group discussions. Uh, Part of this design was that I myself have been, am an introvert, very much so, and I know the feeling of being in training sessions where you're kind of rushed through and you don't have the time to think and reflect on your own before being expected to share out with a larger group. So that is definitely something I want to make sure carries over with that. Uh, accommodating different learning styles as much as I can and making it so that approaching these concepts can be um, exciting and fun and not something that's scary. And so 
With that being said, uh, my website is olivialadell.com. If you're curious to see some of my other talks that I have uh, created, in, including some on uh, social engineering, team building, mentoring, um, please do check those out. And I'll stop sharing the screen now. Thank you all so much. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Olivia, for a great talk. Uh, let me check for some questions coming up on YouTube chat. And I think some of them are coming on slide.do slash OWASP. Oh, um, I can see one. Uh, which was the easiest vulnerability to describe in the workbook? And which was the hardest? Oh, that's a good question. Yeah. Um, let me see. I think the easiest one for me to describe was uh, using components with known vulnerabilities. That's why I put it as the first one, because I was thinking uh, if I had to explain this to someone who has never done anything with security before and they have this resistance to the idea of security, I can present it in a very simple way as hey, there's this thing that's known to have some stuff in it that's not really good, but you, you, you want to use that anyway? Don't do that. I mean, again, that's a very non-technical description of that. Um, so that was a pretty easy one to, to start off with. The hardest <laughs> uh, the, was probably the um, XML external entities because that was definitely one where I, I had to sit down with a bunch of Post-it notes because that's how I personally like to develop training materials. And I had to map out the, the kind of uh, diagram of everything that was included in there. Like even trying to, well, you have to explain what XML is. You have to explain what an entity is. Then you get into the concept of a parser too. And I, as I mentioned, I always wanna be very cognizant of not giving students too much of a heavy cognitive load so that they're, piecing together so many different parts. But yeah, that one, that <laughs> it was a challenge, but uh, hopefully it, it'll help learners to, to get even just a little bit further into it than they might be. Oh, fantastic. Uh, thanks, Olivia. I'm actually seeing another question, and this is coming from OWASP's executive director, oh. Andrew Vanderstock, which is amazing. He's joining oh. us and watching hey, us live. And he's asking, do you want to work with us, the OWASP Top 10 project, on bringing this up to date when we work on the new OWASP Top 10 2021? Yes, yes, yes. Very much so. Yeah, Andrew, thank you so much for being here. I'm glad you're able to tune in. I, uh, you know, as I was, as I mentioned, this kind of started as like a, a quarantine project for me. And I, I, um, I happened to tweet about it one day last summer thinking no one would see it. And then the, the OWASP dev slop team saw it and they're like, hey, uh, this sounds great. And I thought, oh, now I have to do this. But yay, I get to do this. And uh, I, I'm so excited because this uh, over the, the past year has become something that I've realized is not just like a one and done kind of thing. It's definitely something I want to continue to evolve and, and shape and grow because I'm just so passionate about helping beginners feel like they have a place in, in, in this community. And um, yeah, so looking forward to uh, um, um, continuing to work with everyone. Fantastic, thanks very much, Olivia. I think we have a question slash suggestion. Um, this workbook looks like a fabulous resource. Thank you for creating one. And uh, one suggestion, suggestion for it is to put a conversion number or a date on it. So when someone returns, they can easily see if it has been further improved. So currently, if yes. you just open that Google document, you don't really see any version yes. or um, date. Agreed. Thank you so much. That has been on my to-do list to add in there. And yeah, definitely want to make sure that uh, people have that reference point there so that they can see. Um, there, there's also been uh, people who've reached out to me for, uh, they, they've offered to um, translate it into so far Spanish and Portuguese. So having that versioning, I think is going to be really helpful so that we'll keep track of um, which one is which. And yeah, now that's motivating me to um, relearn some Spanish. So <laughs> yeah.